you here with us today. I hope you've come and you're ready to hear what God would say to you. Uh, because I'm ready to preach uh, what I believe the Lord has laid on my heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Somebody said, uh oh, he's loosening his tie. That means he's about to get fired up. I, I don't know if I will or I won't, but uh, it's a little more comfortable. I love to preach to you because this is a church that loves God's word. Amen. Amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians, it is the last uh, little few verses of the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. And he said this, Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful. Hallelujah. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. Live in harmony and peace. Now, he said all that because of this next thing. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. You see, there's a lot of churches today that don't have God with them. They're going through the motions, but they don't have God with them. I want God with me in this church. Amen. Praise God. Greet each other with Christian love. Amen. I'm so glad the ESV said that differently because in the King James Version, it says greet each other with a holy kiss. That's just kind of gross, <laughs> especially with a mask on. Amen. But the correct interpretation is greet each other in Christian love. All of God's people here send you their greetings. Now pay attention to verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus... And the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. I'm going to preach today with the help of the Lord on grace, love, and communion. Grace, love, and communion. You can be seated. Thank you for standing in honor of the word of the Lord today. I believe that every word in this thing we call the Bible... Every word is inspired by God. It is breathed by the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter if it's an introduction or a greeting or a salutation or the ending of one of Paul's letters. Every word of the scripture has a blessing in it. It has information and wisdom and revelation in it. There's not one word in the Bible that you can read that God does not have purpose in. Amen. I'm so glad that I found out that there are nuggets of gold in even the smallest things in God's Word. And I found, as I was praying this week, I found, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I was praying, Lord, what do we need for Life Church to have Revival. What do we need? What can we do? Uh, do we need to do this or do we need to do that? What can make Life Church a vibrant revival church? And the Lord directed me to this scripture, and I saw something here that I believe is a golden nugget of revival for the church. Amen. I, I believe that there are some things that we don't see in the scripture that if we did see them, life would be so much better. Amen. In this uh, ending to the scripture, the Spirit of God, uh, it, it tells us that the Spirit of God can be in and upon a single believer. All right? There are many in this room today that have the Holy Spirit in you and on your life. But... There's something different when several people who are filled with the Spirit come together collectively. It's more powerful than just you by yourself. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. There's something about where two or three gather in the name of the Lord and pray in faith. It's more powerful. It, it is amazing. One of us is not as strong as all of us. Can you say amen? amen. I have found that there is a power that comes when God's church unite together in prayer, 
in fasting and in reading the word of God. And there is a power that comes together when we do uh, this thing called church together. Now notice in the following verses in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 through 27. Now we're, today's Valentine's Day isn't it? Yeah. It's a wonderful time to express love. It's a wonderful time to express our appreciation and care for one another. Amen. And so in Ephesians, Paul tells the church, For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Amen. Jesus came and gave up his life for the church, for you and I. Isn't that a beautiful picture of love? To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of the word. And he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church. Amen. Without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Uh, instead, she will be holy and without fault. You know what God is going to be looking for when he comes back, when Jesus comes back? He's looking for a church that is in the right place at the right time, wearing a spotless garment without spot or wrinkle. And he's looking for some things in the church that will tell him they're not just playing church. They are the church. Right. Amen. Amen. God's church is a glorious church. Yeah. I'm so glad to be a part of the church of the living God. I am so glad that, that I don't have the attitude that I'm just fine all by myself. No, I need you and you need me. We need each other. Yeah. That's how God designed it. Amen. Amen. Uh, God is looking for a glorious church, a holy church, a clean church. Washed by the word of God without fault. Amen. Somebody said, Pastor, how are we going to have revival? How are we going to get people back to church uh, on the other side of COVID? How are we going to recover from what COVID has done for us? Listen, never let the devil tell you that God's church is not as powerful as Amen. it's always been. Amen. We can still unite in prayer. We can still rally around the word of God. Amen. And we are still found without fault because we live by the word of God. Yeah. In the book of Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31, we find that the church thrives when we pray together. Brother Dan and I were talking just before service, and I was speaking with my wife yesterday, and we said the church that comes together and prays together is a powerful church that is full of the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. When we collectively, I know you can pray by yourself. I know you can pray at home doing your dishes. I know you can pray going down the road in your car. But there's something powerful when God's church comes together Amen. and prays together. Amen. You unite your faith with my faith. And we believe in the promises of God. Amen. There's something powerful about it. And in Acts 4.29, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. I want to be part of a church where we can preach boldly without fear or favor or how many likes we get on Facebook right. or who's going to talk bad about us. Listen, the church cannot afford to whimper down and be afraid to speak the truth Amen. and the word of God because it is the only thing that will save this generation. Amen. 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 And while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are being performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they, everybody say they. they. It didn't say individuals, it said they. When they came together and they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. The actual building, the ground the church was on, began to shake and tremble. Why? Because God's people came together and they prayed under one cause in the name of the Lord and the place where they were at was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I wonder today if you miss the days when we all come together and we pray together until the Holy Ghost takes over and we're all yeah. filled up to full and overflowing with the Holy 
continued to speak the word of God with boldness. What this world needs today is a church that will speak with boldness the word of God to a lost and dying generation. Amen. Listen to me. Don't you ever believe the lie of the devil that says they don't want to hear it. Don't believe that the word is ineffective. No, when we speak the word of God with boldness, it is able to come into the heart, crack through the calluses of the heart, go through the drug addiction, and get to the heart of somebody that's broken, messed up, wounded, and needs the Savior. Lord, baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with a spirit of boldness to speak your word. Hallelujah. You see, this thing we call the church is God's body on the earth. Christ is the head of the church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Christ is the head of the church. But, and we always go in the direction of the head of the church. Jesus Christ guides the church. Jesus Christ tells us where to go. But we are the body of Christ in the earth today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27 says, Now ye, meaning collectively, now ye, he's talking to the church, are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ collectively and members in particular. Now listen, some of you have talents that I don't have. Some of you have abilities that I don't have. You have an influence into certain aspects of this world that I could never have. But we collectively come together and we are the body of Christ in the earth. Praise God. We all have different gifts. We all have different strengths. And all of these are good and all of these are blessed. But when God's church collectively comes together... We are, listen to me, we are the most powerful force on the face of the earth. Yes, Amen. That's right. We are. When God's church comes together, you can read all through the book of Acts. When they would get together and pray, when they would get together and they would seek the face of God, and God would use the church. Listen, this church can get together and pray for churches in Africa on the other side of the world that are facing persecution, and God can stop armies by the church. God can change governments by the prayers and the, the, the boldness of the church. Armies can't stop what God's church can do. Amen. And hell's demons are afraid of a church that is united. Amen. Amen. I've been preaching and teaching quite a bit about God's church lately because I, I feel as though sometimes we feel because of COVID and because we've been locked inside and because everything has been rearranged, we feel as though the church is falling apart. Let me tell you something. God's spirit is, is telling me, and I hope it's witnessing to you, God's church is still just as powerful as it's ever been. You say, but where's everybody at? We are going to come back together, get in the same place, get in the same mind, get in the same accord, filled with the same spirit. And I'm telling you, there's a revival coming. I can feel it in my bones. I can see it by vision. And I feel like the Lord is going to bring the church back together. We're going to be as powerful as right. we've ever been. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. The New Testament church was so powerful that the Jews... And the Romans wanted to kill its leaders. You know what causes the world to hate Christianity? Because they know how powerful we can be when we're united. Right. Yeah. Amen. We're nothing when we're fragmented. Right. But when we come together, listen, it used to be in America that there were people in the chambers of Congress that would pray and read the word of God and laws and decisions were made because a preacher prayed and the word of God was adhered to. But now laws and things are made just to please every group that's out there. Listen, we need to get back to the basics of believing Amen. that the church can still have influence in this world Amen. even today. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Why did the Romans and the Jews want to kill 
the leaders of the church because they saw that the church was multiplying like crazy and God was doing signs and miracles and wonders through the church. Listen, the church can never afford to get away from that. I believe in miracles. I believe in healing. I believe God can raise the dead. I believe demons can be cast out. I believe God can do everything His Word says He can do. But He can't do it through a divided church. He only does it through a church that comes together. A church that prays together. Reads God's Word together. Fasts together. And puts God first in everything they do. Amen. You might ask yourself, when you read the book of Acts and you read through the New Testament, what made the church so powerful? And I'm going to tell you in the next 20 minutes what made the church so powerful. It's found in this little nugget of scripture that I read to you. He said, dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. He said two words that every revival church has got to be mindful of. He said, be joyful. Be joyful. Nobody wants to come to a church where everybody's sad and everybody's just barely limping into church and can't hardly get through the service without falling asleep. No, you've got to decide that you're going to have the joy of the Lord in your heart no matter what. It does not matter how I feel when I walk in this place. I have received a mandate from the Word of God to be joyful. Amen. It's my choice whether I'm going to have the joy of the Lord or not. Amen. Somebody said, well, you don't understand, preacher, what I'm going through. Listen, you can go through hell on earth and everything be falling apart. But if you make up your mind, I'm going to be joyful just to make the devil mad. Yeah. I'm going to be full of the joy of the Lord. Be joyful. Hallelujah. Yeah. I'm going to be joyful. And then he said, grow to maturity. Now, all these things are leading up to something. Be joyful. I want this church to be a joyful church, uh, full of the joy of the Lord. When the songs are being sung, uh, we can't help it. We've got to get out in the aisle and raise our hand. Uh, be joyful because his grace uh, has set me free. Be joyful because I should be a sinner sitting on a bar stool, barely making it through life. Uh, but Jesus saved my soul from hell. I'm going to be joyful. That's Amen. what the church needs. In this last day. And then grow up to maturity. Everybody in the church is not as mature as everybody else. There are some people that are coming in. They don't know all the scripture like you know the scripture. They don't know all the Bible stories. Listen, this generation that's coming in the church now, they don't know what Easter's for. They don't know if Christmas is about Santa Claus or about Jesus coming uh, to the manger. They don't know. And so they have to grow in maturity. And there are some people, listen, I've been in the church my whole life, but I'm still growing in maturity. Amen. Paul said, if you be joyful and grow to maturity, then something's going to happen. We've got to grow up in the Lord. We've got to mature in the Lord by reading his word, putting aside childish feelings. Putting aside, well, I want it my way. And if, if they don't do it my way, I'm going to get my ball and go home. No, no. Grow up in the Lord. You see, after you grow up in the Lord, you're not depending on the creature to spoon feed you and feed you a bottle of milk. No, after a while, you're eating the meat of God's Word. And you can sustain yourself through the week, not on the prayers of somebody else, but through your own precious Grow up and mature in the Lord. And I like the next part. Paul said, encourage each other. Yep. Encourage each other. Listen, this is a vital part of the church, especially now when people are shut in and they can't come to church. They're fearful of whether to come to the church. When's the last time you called one of our elder saints and said, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. There's, a, there's many people that are not here today. Get the church directory. Find one of them, at least one of them. Call them up and say, I missed you today. 
I love you. I'm praying for you. The scripture says, encourage one another. Sometimes we don't know what our brother's going through because they're ashamed to say it. But when the church is a joyful church and the church is growing in maturity and we're encouraging one another, I want to tell you something. you got a revival church when people are looking out for one another, encouraging one another. And can I tell you something? Sometimes your pastor needs a little word of encouragement. Sometimes I need somebody to say, Pastor, the church is doing great. Sometimes I need somebody to say, I'm praying for you. Now, I'm not giving myself kudos, but we're in this thing together, Amen. folks. Yep, come on. Amen. And then he finally says, live in harmony and peace. I've never seen a day in my life. We're on Facebook right now, but Facebook has caused us more fights than any other thing I've ever seen. Yep, come on. And most of the people fighting are Christian folks. Fighting over whether you're Republican or Democrat or whether you like this person or that person. Fighting, fighting, posting things that shouldn't be posted because you might hurt or harm your brother or sister. Amen. Amen. Leave it alone because the Bible says we need to strive for harmony and peace. Well, what is harmony? If I play one note on the piano, it sounds pretty good. But if I add two or three more notes together that all sound different, a C, an E, and a G, they all sound different. I'm not asking you to be cookie-cutter Christian and everybody be the same. You're going to have your strengths, and you're going to have your strengths, and your talents, and your time of prayer, and your way of looking at the Bible. We're not all the same, but when we come together in harmony, it's a beautiful sounding thing because we complement one another. Hallelujah. And then God said, we're to live in peace. Live in harmony and peace. You know what most people are looking for when they come to a church for the first time? They want to see what kind of vibe they get. Right. Uh -huh. What kind of feeling they get. And this church is doing a lot of good. Because the number one thing I hear from people that visit this church is they were so friendly and so kind to me. But they pick up on an unseen vibe. Amen. And what they want to feel more than anything else in the world is peace and harmony. Yeah. I hear people say, I went to a church, I went there three times, nobody spoke a word to me. Thank God that doesn't happen in this church. Nope. Come on. If anything, we'll, we'll kill you with kindness. <laughs> Amen. Because we're just glad to be part of the family of God. Peace and harmony. Now when all these things come together. Hallelujah. There's something amazing. That happens. Because the Bible said. In our text today. That when we get these things together. Then the God. Of love and peace. Will be with you. Right. Right. Now everybody says. That their church has God in it. But let me tell you something. You can be as religious as the day is long and God won't come to your church. You can have the, the greatest of creeds and the highest of steeples and a beautiful uh, array of stained glass windows and God never shows up. I want people to know that when they come to this church, God is here. Yeah. And God is here. And, and we are a church that complements one another and believes in one another. People that are allowing your brothers and sisters to grow in the Lord. And then finally the scripture says this. Paul tells the church at Corinth that God will fill the church with three of the most powerful things. Somebody said, Pastor, if we're going to have revival, we're going to have to black out the church and get some stage lighting, and we're going to have to have a fog machine and coffee in the foyer, and we're going to have to have a young uh, a worship leader with skinny jeans and a torn t-shirt and, and strumming a guitar because that's what all the other churches have. Now listen, if that works for other churches, hallelujah, praise God. But I want to tell you something. What really makes a church, a revival church, are three things. Amen. Three things. Grace, 
love and communion. And Paul tells the church at Corinth that God will fill the church with three of the most powerful things that make any church unstoppable. The, he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've been teaching on grace on Wednesday nights, if, if none of you have been able to log into that. But the grace of God is the favor of God. How many of you, when you get up on Monday morning, you say, you know what, I'm, I'm getting in my car and the favor of God is going with me. How many of you believe with all of your heart when you walk into work, God is going to give me favor with my boss. God is going to give me favor with my co-workers. God is going to give me favor in every decision I make. Listen, I've learned to walk in the favor of God. When I pull in the parking lot of Walmart, I believe God's going to give me a, a parking spot close to the front. Because I believe that powerfully in the favor of God that is on my life. I hope somebody in this church uh, will believe that God's favor is on Light Church. That God is going to open up doors to us that have never been opened before. And God's people that are united together under the cause of Jesus Christ, God's favor is upon our life. Amen. You see, when you know you've got the favor of the mayor, you kind of walk a little differently. Don't mess with me because my buddy is the mayor. That's favor. You see, you might not have the favor of the mayor, but you got the favor of Jesus Christ on your life. And there is nothing more powerful than a church that believes I've got God's favor on everything I do, everything I say, every opportunity I have. God is pouring his favor out on my life. I have learned to not lean upon my own uh, ability and my own wisdom. It, that doesn't matter because there's always somebody smarter than you. There's always somebody that can preach better than me. There's always somebody who knows more of the Bible than me. But I lean on God's grace, his favor on my life because I know what it can do. That's right, man. Hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace that allows you to enter in places that were always shut to you. Grace that gives favor that I don't have to work for. Amen. And then the next thing that Paul said is, is God's love. A church that knows that God loves that church is a powerful church. Now there are some people, they don't know God loves them. It's all based on feelings. It's all based on circumstances. Listen, you can be poor I mean, you don't have two nickels to rub together, but if you know God loves you, you'll feel like the richest person on the planet. A church, listen, I know we don't have a praise band. I know we don't have a worship leader that can sing uh, great uh, anthems of praise. I know we don't have the biggest church in Elwood, but I do believe that the love of God is upon this church. God loves this church. God loves you because you are the church. I don't have to go around with a sad look on my face because I'm walking in the love of God. I'm telling you, God loves me. We sang it this morning. He's for me. He's not against me. And the God of heaven loves me with a divine love. Amen. Praise God. God's love brings true compassion, true brotherhood. True sisterhood, regardless of our differences. There are people in this church that may not see things the same way I do, but I love them anyway, and they should love me. When a church loves one another, the devil can't, he can't sneak in and get a hold of your brain and convince you you are not loved. No, the love of God permeates everything you think and everything you do. Right. That's revival. Somebody said, oh, pastor, we need to get somebody in here that would make people shout and run the aisles and scream and yell. I've seen that my whole life. Preacher comes, and everybody gets excited, runs, screams, yells, jumps up and down. The minute he leaves, they go back to going to sleep. What true revival is, is when we're living in the favor of God and we're living in the love of God every day of the week. Not just on Sunday and not just on Wednesday. Hallelujah. I want to ask you the question this morning, and I don't have much time. 
But do you really believe that God loves you? Do you really believe that God loves you? But you don't know what I've done, Pastor. You, you don't know what I thought last night. You don't know what was in my mind. You don't know what I've been through. But do you believe God loves you? If you don't, let me tell you how much God loves you. He loved you enough to give his only, only begotten son. And he came to this planet knowing all the while that he was going to be beaten, that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be hated, he was going to be mocked at, but he sent his son anyway, and the only purpose for him coming was so that he could die a horrible death on a cross so I could have salvation and go to heaven. That's how much your God loves you. Amen. He loves you with a deep, deep love. And then God's love brings unity. You see, the old Barney song, I love you, you love me, we're all a great big family. Don't slap me for singing Barney. <laughs> but you know what? It really does simplify things. When God's church is a loving church, the devil can't defeat it. When God's church is a church living in God's favor every day of their life, we can do things that God says we can do. And then Jesus said, in the last days, anybody believe we're living in the last days? Yes. In the last days, these days, the love of many will grow cold. But not in God's church. If we're going to err on the side of love, you're always going to be right. But they hurt my feelings. Love them anyway. But they don't see it the way I see it. Love them anyway. But, but they said something on Facebook that I don't like. Love them anyway and don't type anything back. Love is the answer for a church to affect the community. Love is the greatest means for us to reach the heart of Elma, Indiana, and those that are looking for a place that will forgive them of the atrocities of their life. There are going to be people that are coming, coming to this church that have done horrible things. You know why they're coming here? Because they need somebody. They need a God that will love them and will forgive them, and they need a church family that will love them and see them grow and mature. God. Amen. Amen. Somebody said today's Valentine's Day. Why are you preaching like this? Because what this world needs more than anything else is the love of God. And where do they find the love of God? They find it through you and me. Amen. Jesus said in the last days many, their love will grow cold. But God's church thrives and revives on loving one another. Bearing one another's burdens. Speaking words of kindness and loving each other as Christ loved us. Hallelujah. And then finally, Paul said, a revival church is going to have fellowship or communion with the Holy Ghost. I've got two minutes to sum this up. But a church that does not love and adore fellowship with the Holy Ghost is missing something that a revival church has got to have. You've got to have the Holy Ghost and fellowshipping and communing with the Holy Ghost every single day. Not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, not just when an evangelist comes. Every day, I need the Holy Ghost. Every day, I need the Spirit to guide me, to help me to know what to say and what not to say. I need the Holy Ghost to whisper in my ear and tell me I'll never leave you or abandon you. I need the Holy Ghost telling me to go left or go right. I need the Holy Ghost speaking into my life words of comfort and strength. And I'm telling you, you might not have a preacher on Monday morning, but you got the Holy Ghost to go with you and tell you everything is going to be all right. Amen. I'm so glad I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm glad that I have the Spirit of God in me, walking with me, talking with me, telling me about the love of God, reminding me of the promises of God, and helping me to get through this life. 
I'm so glad that a church is founded here in Elwood called Life Church where we believe in the grace of God and we believe in the love of God and we believe in the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. I'm looking for the day when the Holy Ghost hits everybody that walks through the doors and we don't even get through the first song. The Holy Ghost, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost takes over and when I'm preaching somebody just stands up and the Holy Ghost falls on them and they just feel the love of God just wrap around them. I'm telling you that's a revival church. That's the church that God wants to bless us with. A church that has grace and love and fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. amen. That's what God wants his body to look like. Sometimes I look in the mirror at my 56-year-old body and I say, how have you let yourself go? And if we're not careful, we will look at the body of Christ and we'll see who's not here. We'll see that we don't have what every other church has. The only requirement God wants of his church, he didn't say anything about beautiful buildings in his word, did he? No. He didn't say anything about having the greatest technology, did he? He didn't say anything about having 16 Bibles and having creeds and, and dogmas that hang in the church foyer. He didn't say anything about programs. But he did say that he wants the church to have grace, love, and fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes. Amen. That's what God wants his body to look like. Pastor, what are we going to do to keep the church alive? Let's get grace, love, and fellowship with the Holy Ghost in all that we do. You see, the church goes on beyond Sunday. The church is more than a Wednesday night teaching session. The church is you living out the Word of God every day. Amen. Give grace to those who don't deserve it. Give love to those who don't deserve it. And listen and fellowship in the Holy Ghost. There are some people in this church that their prayer closet is the shower. When they get in the shower, it's not long until hot water's ran out and they're wrinkling like a prune. But they've been fellowshipping with the Holy Ghost. I don't care how you do it, but find a place where you can have time alone. Fellowshipping and communion with God's Spirit. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And then, I guarantee you, you can conquer anything life throws at you. Yes, you can. Anything God throws or the devil throws in your path, you can avoid it because the Holy Ghost will say, walk around that. Yes. Uh -huh. Aren't you glad for the Spirit of the Lord? Yes. Let's stand today. I hope you've been encouraged today about being part of this thing we call the church. I said in our Wednesday night Bible teaching, there are no lone rangers. Right. No lone rangers in the church. Right. Amen. We need each other. We need, I need your prayer. You need my prayer. Yes. I need a fellowship. Yes. Because life can get lonely when you decide you're going to leave the world and follow Jesus. Yeah. You know where I find my strength? I find it when I'm fellowshipping with you. Amen. Find somebody this week and encourage them. Find somebody this week and tell them I love you. I appreciate you. Amen. I wonder if we could bow our heads as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I can't thank you enough. For this thing called the church. Lord we are. Locked arm in arm together. One with the other. Help us to live. As never before. In your favor. Help us to live as never before. Knowing that you love. Your church. We're loved by you. And God I pray. Your spirit would invade. Every part of our life. Lord when we get up in the morning. Let us realize the Holy Spirit is right there in that home with us. Lord, when we're driving down the road in our car, the Holy Ghost is in the next seat. 
Lord, I pray that when we lay down at night, there be no evil come into our mind because the Holy Ghost is there. And I pray, God, that your spirit would lead and guide and direct us everywhere you want us to go. Praying for the sick, casting out devils, doing the work of the kingdom. And Lord, I pray more than anything else, you would shine your light on your word. Because we live by your word. And in the mighty name of Jesus, let the church say, Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you. Have a great week in the Lord. Don't let anything discourage you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. amen.